I have the great honour of being able to introduce Celia Gaze, and I believe you're going to tell us tales of llamas and dicky bows. Uh, thank you, everyone. My name is Celia Gaze, and for the introduction, I'm the founder and managing director of the Wellbeing Farm. Now, before I start this talk, I'm so sorry, but if you were expecting a talk on rearing llamas or looking after llamas, you're going to be sadly disappointed. But if you are expecting a talk on how something that happens to you ends up completely transforming your life and making you so much happier and making the most out of life and you will hopefully get something out of this talk so i've not lost any of you so i'm gathering you for the the latter rather than learning about llamas okay brilliant so i'm going to go back slightly to around 10 years ago when i actually was um quite a, a high profile, quite a good job in the NHS. I was uh, a director in the NHS, the person who was sadly tasked with closing maternity units, changing a &E departments, reconfiguring services, and I had just had a baby. And while on maternity leave, they called me back and said, would you be interested in a, in a project? And that project, was to save £42 million from the NHS as a local NHS organisation. And at the time I was, do I, become, do I stay with being a mum or do I go with a career? And it was so, so hard because I've always been somebody who's been career driven. And looking back, whether or not it was the right decision, but I chose to go with a career. So in the mornings I'd be breastfeeding a baby go to work, deliver this project, and come back. But the problem with turnaround projects is it gets worse before it gets better. And when you are in a position when, um, on a Monday, I'm driving into work, and I was, um, felt chest pains going down my arm, I could hardly breathe, it was like a constant cloud, and whereas I thought I was good with my job, I was right, and everybody's looking at me going, well, she can't turn around, she's clearly lost her touch. She was really good before she had the baby, and now she's kind of failing. And, and it was nothing like that, but I perceived, I perceived that I was turning out to be a failure. I couldn't do this job, I felt I was being judged. And it got to one point when, in the middle of a... Um, board meeting to discuss the turnaround project. The turnaround project which I was uh, uh, you know, delivering, it got to the point when I ended up walking out of the meeting in, in a flood of tears. And I just felt so embarrassed. And somebody said to me, you've got to go to the doctor. There's something wrong. And I said, I don't need a break. I just, I just, I don't understand what's happening to me. So I go over to the doctors and he goes, Celia, you're heading for a breakdown. And, uh, and I said, oh, no, I just need a few days off. I'll be all right. And he goes, no, you won't be all right. And I said, look, well, well, what are we talking about? Do we have a couple of days off? Do we, do we take a weekend or whatever? He said, you have to take time off because you're going to be very ill if you don't. And for me, it was a massive shock because I'd almost been putting the work before my health. I'd given everything to do this. And for the, for, the, for the GP to sort of say to me, you've got to stop working for me, was a massive wake-up call in some respects. Now, he said to me, I'm going to put you on um, sleeping tablets, and I'm going to put you on medication. And I said, I don't want to go on medication. I want to actually know what on earth is wrong with me. So I left the GP surgery, vowed that he'd sign me off for two weeks, and I got home and I Googled and Googled stress. What on earth is stress? What, does, what happens to you that one minute you're a high-flying NHS director and the next minute you are literally a crumbling wreck, you're crying, you're in a constant state of fog, you think everybody's against you? And what on earth is that condition? And I became so obsessed with finding out about stress, I just wanted to know what on earth it was, that I ended up doing, you know, I couldn't just be stressed. <laughs> and this is, I always take everything to the extreme. So I had to go and study stress. I then ended up doing a qualification in stress. I did a qualification in organizational stress. I can't just be stressed. I had to kind of understand it. And that led to a module while I was on the course. I was doing this course while supposedly on sick, <laughs> you know, stress leave. And it was a course to design a building to minimize stress. And I got so into this 
that I decided that why don't I design this building with a function that if you were stressed, you had somewhere special to go. And this was like nine, you know, nine years ago, ten years ago. And so, basically, I put everything into this coursework. It was a piece of coursework. And the man went at the end, well, I can't give you anything more than a distinction. And I was like, but I don't want this coursework to end. Um, what, you know, what do we do with it now? And um, I, while I was on stress, ended up doing, of all the things, a gift wrapping course. Yeah, it, what, something does exist. You can learn to wrap a gift. And uh, I've always been, I mean, honestly, if you name it, if there is a course, I would have been on it. I've done over 100 courses, obsessed with all these courses. And um, I overheard, and at the time, I was wrapping a football, of all things. They taught you how to wrap a football. And I'm listening in to this, um, these two women who were talking about, they'd gone on this course to learn and run gift wrapping courses from their set for their home and they ran this place uh, where they would run courses from their house and and they clearly had a nice house but you know <laughs> the whole point and i was going my goodness why don't i do that i've always loved to do things i've always loved events why am i stuck in the nhs so i suddenly decided why don't i create a well-being farm. Why don't I create something which is different? Now the farm bit comes in because my partner Stephen, who's actually over there, um, <laughs> he um, he at the time had a farm. Now when I talk about a farm, sorry Stephen, but the farm was in a bit of a state. Neglected is called kind of what I call, describe it as, but it hadn't had much investment. So if you all go, well, she had a farm. It was a little bit of a starting point of probably one of the worst looking farms, but in an amazing location. So if I look out the farm, I can see Wales, but I'm in Bolton, so, you know, it's great. So it had the makings of something really special. And I decided to go and make my um, project that was a piece of coursework into a reality. How on earth, where do you start? You're in the NHS, where on earth do you start doing this? So I started by getting my poor baby at the time and taking him to 195 venues to get ideas. And I literally traveled all round from the south to, I went to Cornwall to Scotland and everything in between, gathering ideas. I created this mammoth plan of what I was going to do from this farm, this amazing thing. I was in the NHS where business cases were 50 pages long, full of evidence, a massive case study. And I presented it to the banks and I got rejection after rejection after rejection. In fact, I was rejected by seven banks. And I was like, how on earth do I step doing this? Well, how do people get a business off the ground? And I then went, um, finally found this man who took my 50 page plan and put it into three pages. And I went to the next bank and it got accepted. Yes, so I had the funding. But then how do you tell somebody who had just got a house and the extent of building was to get a decorator in? All of a sudden, I had to meet with architects. I had to install a wind turbine. I had to install a water treatment plant. I had to deal with plumbers and electricians and transform what was this farm, totally almost knock it down and rebuild it. I had no building experience. I didn't, you know, honestly. And yes, I made so many mistakes. So many mistakes that I ended up with something like 42,000 pounds overspent on the build. And, I, and the next thing I opened, and I end up with this man comes in going lovely premises and I said who are you and he goes I'm from the building business rates so what the hell are business rates what what are you talking about business rate we didn't have that and we didn't have business rates in the NHS and he comes along and he said here's your bill for business rates I was like what the I said, I haven't even just opened, I'm not even trading. How can you present me with a bill for £17,000? I'm not making any money. And common sense is if your business rates before starting a business are higher than River Cottage, where is the common sense in that? So we end up in a tribunal. I'm in a tribunal trying to defend the farm. I get the National Farmers Union behind me. All my experience of defending a high court judicial review against a closure in A&E suddenly got really good because I, I had the experience, I had the, the business rate, the next thing. 
I'm there developing a website. And the website man tries and rips me off. I end up being caught over a flipping website. What else could happen? And the final thing that did happen, December 15, I get my VAT bill. Again, never knew about VAT. £8,000. So I ring up credit cards. You know, they thought I was an NHS director. I'd never told them otherwise. Borrow one. You know, you get these cards going interest free for 18 months. Interest free. You know, I had about seven on the go. All interest free for seven months. So I get my credit card out and I ring the VAT office. Miss Gay's we won't let you pay your VAT bill on a credit card. What are you talking about? I've got a credit card, I could just pay it. No, I'm sorry, you have to pay it. Where's your funds? Well, I haven't, I haven't got any funds. Uh, well, Miss Gaze, if you don't pay your VAT bill, I'm sorry, but you're not gonna be able to continue to trade. Now, here I am. I built this business on the back of Stephen's farm, which was linked to a back of the business that had been running for 130 odd years. I linked to my house and I was set to leave everything. And what, what on earth do you do? And I'll tell you what I did. I was so, I mean, stress in the NHS was nothing compared to stress like this. And I ended up writing, I couldn't even begin to tell anyone what the mess I was in. And the only way I could do it was to write a letter. And I wrote a letter to my mum and I wrote a letter to Stephen telling him everything of the mess I was in and everything. Because I was too embarrassed. And as a result, my mum bailed me out to pay the VAT bill. Now, what happened then is I said I've got a plan, a plan to change, but I'm sorry, mum, but I'm going to need more money to invest in this farm to change it. But I have a, an indoor livery horse riding school, and I reckon it would be good for weddings. So I go back home to my mum. Uh, as you do when you're stressed and over 40, and you go, um, Mum, um, she's clearing out my dad's wardrobe. So my dad had left the family home. And she's clearing them out, and she comes across this bag of bow ties. And the bag of bow ties had been left by my dad because he was a concert pianist. And she's like going, of all the stupid things to leave, what the hell am I going to do with these? And I said, and this is the amount of research that went into this, just give them to me and I'll stick it on a llama. Okay. So as you, do, as you think of. And I got home and I was there and I got the bow tie and I said to Jimmy at the time, I wasn't going to battle to try and get a bow tie on a llama, I'll tell you that. I say to the guy who looked after llamas, put that on the llama and when you, when you uh, have got it on, come and tell me and I'll take a photo. So he comes back in, he goes... It's been a bit of a struggle, but I've managed to get the bow tie on a llama. So I said, oh, give me here, I'll come in. And I'm there with the thing. I wash it on Facebook. And the next thing, it all goes crazy. Forget about a farm. Forget about the features. Forget about everything. Everybody wanted to get married with a bow tie wearing llama. And the weddings went from two weddings to 15 weddings to 43 weddings to 70. And it just grew and grew and grew because I put the bow tie on the llama. And obviously it wasn't about just a bow tie. But we became a venue that stood out, a venue that differentiated itself. We weren't the, the, the venue in Bolton. We were the venue with the bow tie wearing llamas. That was a point. That was, it made itself different. It made itself stand out. And my mum at the time, who, when I told her I was giving up a high-powered NHS career for a job with llamas, who totally thought I was having, clearly having a midlife crisis, suddenly went, well, actually, maybe your idea isn't as bad. And when you end up finally on a, um, a massive feature in Huffington Post, and you end up on the BBC, and you end up in various magazines, you suddenly think, actually, this is it. You know, this is... This is finally come. You finally made something of this farm. And the point of the whole story is nine years ago, well, it was actually 10 years ago, I thought, my goodness, this is the end. And what on earth am I going to do with my life? And the decisions I made about well being, about sustainability, and about llamas 
Absolutely. And now, some of the three biggest trends that are around. Llamas are on Fortnite, Smarties and Imperial Leather. Well-being are like, wow, where's... Well Not ten years ago, if you said you were stressed, they'd probably think you've got some sort of disease. You know, I was talking about being stressed, and they were like, oh, bless her. You know, you know and they didn't want to know. And sustainability, when I put a turbine in, everyone thought I was mad. Why can't you just put it on electricity or gas or whatever? Why do you have to put a turbine in? But this is what happens, and sometimes people will tell you you're stupid, tell you it won't be done, tell you everything. And actually, sometimes, I've failed so many times. If, if I hadn't been stressed in the NHS, if I hadn't got near bankruptcy, if I hadn't made all these mistakes, I would have never, ever have done what I've done today. And now, I have a life where... I work one day, well, I, work, I still work hard because I always I love work, but to be honest, I only visit the farm one day a week. It kind of works around it. We deliver so many weddings. I've got a team in place now, and I had nothing when I started. I was the cook, the cleaner, the washer-upper, the waitress, the wedding planner, you name it. And I have a wedding venue, and I'm not even married, so, you know, I've never even got married myself when I have a wedding venue. So there you go. So the point of the story is... No matter how crazy your idea is, just don't let anybody dampen it because you may think it's great and everybody else, but if you have belief, if you have perseverance in yourself, you will be able to finally get there. That's it. Any, any, any questions about anything I've just talked about? Or you're all like, oh my God, <laughs> where do you start with that one? Yes. Um, we will, we, that, the question was, do we just do weddings or do we do anything else? And we were doing, I mean, when I, at one point in the farm, I was doing 14 different things and that's when it was failing. Because in desperation to survive, I was a cafe, I was school visits, I was um, well-being courses, I was doing llama trekking, you know, everything, and we had to stop and do weddings. Now, it's only now that the business is financially stable that I've kind of been able to kind of look up and go, Oh my goodness, well-being's gone crazy while I've just been focusing on weddings. So in January this year, we launched as a corporate events venue because we're full at weekends. We have bookings till 2023 and, and, but for the weddings, but actually we have this midweek capacity, which is quiet. So we've ended up now launching um, corporate events at the weekend. So it's now a facility that anyone can hire and run events, retreats, um, all sorts of things from. And companies can come for like well-being days and all sorts of things. Thank you. Any other any other question? Nobody wants to know about the rearing of llamas then, or <laughs> good because I won't really want to begin to know anything about you know. And again, I only chose the llama because we had a stable, and, and my criteria for the animal was what would live in a stable, survive in cold weather, and not take a lot of work. And believe it or not, llamas were ticked all those boxes because you don't have to muck them out every day. They're actually very clean animals. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, and my story has been written into a book called Why Put a Bowtie on a Llama? How a Crazy Idea Can Change Your Life and Transform Your Business. So if anybody's interested in more, the book's there. Uh, but thank you so much for giving it your time to listen. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was excellent.